Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Wendy Dillard here. Today is Tuesday, February the 6th, 2018, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, your second daily dose of happy for the, for the day. And uh, we're off to a good start this week, the second day that we're working on a new book. We're working on the book, The Law of Attraction, The Basics of the Teachings of Abraham by Esther and Jerry Hicks. And uh, we, we settled on this one Wendy, because uh, we both agree this is the ultimate primer for anyone who wants to get exposed to the law of attraction for the first time. And and I think we still agree that the next day it's still the best primer. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's got all the, it's a summary, it's an overview, it's got the details, it's got everything. And today we're actually going to be defining the law of attraction as it's defined in the book, so that's going to be a good thing to, to look forward to. But first... As usual, we have to do our wins for the day, and uh, I, I'm trying to think what my biggest win is, because there's so many good things happening. That That's what happens after a while. You get so many good things happening. Like, which one do you pick, you know? But if I had to pick one, I'd say the biggest win is, is more of an anticipation win, because um, mm. Tom Wells and I are going to start doing a weekly evening podcast, which I think I mentioned yesterday. Um, yeah. starting a week from tonight and I'm already looking forward to it because this is going to be the, the whole purpose of it is to encourage people who can't call in during the day to call because evening hours are usually the best time for most people to call so I'm just really mm -hmm. curious to see how that experiment is going to work out I'm, I'm excited about it so what time of the evening are you going to do that call uh, starting next Tuesday, February 13th, we're going to do it uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern Time for at least an hour. We may actually go longer than an hour depending on you know how many people call in. If we have enough calls coming in, we'll probably keep going because the one difference between that time slot and the others is that that one is not currently scheduled for playing on PRN. So uh, we don't have to fit the one-hour format that PRN needs us to fit. So we may just go overtime on that one. Who knows? Very cool. Yeah, it is Well, this cool. is definitely mo moving us toward the goal of um, having this radio station move 24-7. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I, we say that goal, and I say to myself, wow, 24-7? <laughs> oh, that would be incredible. But, but that's where we're headed. Well, you realize, well, you're now going to do three shows on a Tuesday. Yeah, I'm not sure how that's going to work. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> do I have what it takes to do three separate shows at three separate times? We will find out. I know in the radio industry that's pretty common. I mean, you pretty much have well, to be ready to say, work any yeah, time. Yeah, when of day I worked at broadcast radio, uh, most of the radio personalities I worked with they did a three-hour show. Oh yeah, yeah. But and, that's very different than three one-hour shows. They, well, they did a three-hour show and they. Time. They probably also spent time in the studio doing voiceovers for commercials, and then they had to do uh, public service announcements, and then they filled in for their friend at uh, 10 o'clock at night. And they, they work a little <laughs> bit more than just three-hour shifts, I know. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly. So, yeah, you have to kind of be willing to uh, wear a lot of hats when you do radio. So I guess we're kind of getting into that mode. We're saying, well, okay, cool. we want to be a radio force. Well, then we have to behave like one, don't we? Yes, we do. I mean, it's just part of the way it works. Um, I have a I have a really cool win. Oh, good. Um, it, it started last night. I was thinking about, you know, when I'm going to, I'm now going to call it Project X, which uh -huh. is the experiment of being deliberate with um, setting an intention for a desired outcome using law of attraction and all that I know about the law of attraction principles. Okay. So I'm going to call it Project X. Um, so I was thinking all weekend long about Project X. And um, a com I had a conversation with a, um, a colleague on Saturday, and it kind of spun, if you will, my thoughts into a new place, as in, like, it expanded my, cons my considerations about Project X, things mm -hmm. I'd never thought about. And I went, ooh, this is really exciting. Okay. So I had this incredible feeling of, oh, I've just expanded. I love this. And I knew that that was part of the manifestation towards the fulfillment of Project X. Mm -hmm. So okay. I kind of, I didn't have anything major I had to do over the weekend, and so I just kind of set the intention I was going to let my thoughts marinate in, in the, the new ideas and, and allowing whatever thoughts and expansions to come to me. So I did that, and yesterday I was talking to my girlfriend about what I'd done over the weekend, 
And I said, you know, an interesting question appeared to me. Like, how do I, Wendy Dillard, how do I know when I'm really broadcasting the signals toward Project X? How do I know? How do I know I'm in a good place? How do I know that's what I'm sending out? And she went, that's a really cool question. I said, well, I'm pondering it because all weekend long, I kind of thought I was focused on it, but when I'm focused on something that I don't know exactly what the outcome is going to look like, I didn't know if the focusing I was doing, quote, was working. (laughs) And so as we kind of toyed around with the subject, I said, you know, I do know when I'm sending out a negative broadcast. I feel it in my whole body. I know I'm not feeling good, so I know I'm sending out something really yucky. And I said, but in this case, I wasn't quite sure if I was sending out something really positive. And so I was thinking, just kind of to get some comparative data for myself, I was thinking about like when I'm on the show with you, Walt. Okay. I know when I'm sending out some really awesome broadcast signals because Mm -hmm. my whole body is engaged, my Uh voice is engaged, my inflection is there. I mean, I feel excited, exuberant, I'm using juicy, delicious words. And when I'm doing that, it's really obvious to me, and I think anyone who's listening to me, oh, yeah, Wendy's got a really good, strong broadcast signal going out for something positive. Mm -hmm. Yep. But I, I wasn't feeling that way over the weekend. I was by myself most of the weekend, and I was kind of doing quiet, reflective activities. And then the thought came to me, and this is why why I'm calling this a win, because it was a new thought. The thought came to me that because I'm in a very positive state most of the time, that of course I was sending out positive signals. It's just that for me, it wasn't the -the over-the-top exuberant hugeness. It was the subtle, happy, joyful, feeling good about it. And I thought, well, how do I really know that? And I went, because there was, I felt no resistance in it. Mm, yes. And I can say, I do know what resistance feels like, because it always feels like I'm tied up in knots, and it's just anything of a negative nature equals resistance. And because what I was feeling over the weekend was lacking any of those negative resistant thoughts or feelings, then by process of elimination, I was broadcasting something positive. That makes sense. And even though what I just said is not provable, it feels very resonantly truthful within me. And so I just thought I would share that. You know, if anybody wants to comment and say, oh, yes, you're crazy, or yes, you're right on, or whatever, if you've ever had an experience along that line, I'd be very interested. But to me, it felt like a real win that I could recognize that even though I'm not over the top broadcasting, not all broadcasts come that way. That's true. And I've, you know, I've thought about some other things that have manifested really quickly in my life where there was nothing more than a fleeting thought Mm -hmm. and it showed up. So I'm thinking, well, there wasn't the over the top, overly positive, you know, broadcast to make that happen. So, I guess I've just been kind of experimenting and playing with how do you know when you're sending the right signal. And I think right now what I'm feeling is it's based on how you feel in the moment. Mm -hmm. If you don't feel icky, then there's no resistance, then it's good. At least that's what I'm concluding at the moment. We just want to make sure that people understand that icky is a technical term, in case you didn't know that. (laughs) I introduced it here on LOA Today a couple weeks ago. Yes. And it was very carefully defined, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just seems to work work really well in certain circumstances when I'm talking. <laughs> I do have one question. Now, when you were talking with yourself, you are doing self-talk, basically, over the weekend. Do you remember any of the substance of your self-talk? I mean, obviously, you can't give away your project. I understand that. But um, do you remember any of the self-talk? You know, it's interesting because I'm a big self-talker, and I don't think there was nearly as much self-talk is there was, I would just focus on certain thoughts um, that I had received as manifestational thoughts. You know, a new idea would come to me or a new expansive thing would come to me. And I just literally focused on it. But I didn't talk about it to myself. I didn't try to turn it into something else. 
I just kind of let myself sit with it and focus on it. That's the phrase. That's the phrase that comes to my mind. It sounds like you were just sitting with it. You were sitting there and, I, and just enjoying it and kind of soaking it in. Mm-hmm. That was kind of like if you're sitting in front of a beautiful sunset, you may not be saying internally like, wow, look at those beautiful bands of orange. Ooh, isn't it cool that the bands of orange run into the pink and then it kind of turns a little bit rust. And I mean, we don't, at least I don't say that to myself. <laughs> if I'm looking at a beautiful sunset, I just sit before it and just appreciate it. Mm. And there are no real words. It's just a kind of a state of being. Yeah, I think appreciation. I think the biggest set of words that I usually experience is that's a beautiful sunset, and that's about the extent of it. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't get much deeper than <laughs> and, that. <laughs> and then you just sit and you look, yeah, and you bask in it and you enjoy. So, um, I'd say over the weekend that's where I was most of the time. That's you know, like and if I weekend. got distracted and you know was busy doing dishes or TV was on or something else. And I wanted to remind myself, ooh, I want to go back to focusing on Project X. I would just pick one of the thoughts about Project X and just kind of bask in it. I'd say that's a definite win. It sounds like a really lovely way to spend a weekend, just feeling good the entire weekend. <laughs> hey, that's a nice weekend, no matter how you look at that. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, it was very lovely. So, we And we'll see what comes of it. Um, I would say there's one... And I got this this morning. There's kind of like one time frame um, aspect of Project X that I think happens around the first week of March. Maybe um, might be the end of the first week, and then the next time frame for Project X is the first of April. So we'll see where I come in terms of those timings. You're going to have a lot of time to kind of. Like to use your word, to marinate on what's going on. You got a month to marinate on it before that first time frame hits. Yeah, and simultaneously, a lot of stuff needs to occur before each one of those uh, dates on the calendar happen. Mm -hmm. So, but what I'm marinating on is just the essence of the fulfillment of it and what it feels like when it's here, when it's arrived when I'm experiencing Project X in its fulfillment. Um, because honestly, Walt, I don't have the details that I can focus on yet. I mean, I know what I want out there, but because I don't know how it's going to show up, um, I'm, I'm marinating on the feelings, on the end result feelings. I mean, that's what I've heard Abraham say a number of times, yep. is if you feel like it feels when you already have it, then it has to come. And a lot so, of LOA gurus say the same thing. I mean, the one common theme that I think is most common to all of them is that you want to focus on the end result. And even if you don't know exactly what the end result is, you want to focus on how the end result will feel, which is exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of like when somebody wants to feel happy, that's it's something that's real, and yet it's sort of nebulous because if your goal is to be happy, well, you don't know what things will create happy. You just know happy feels happy. And that's kind of how my Project X is. I'm focusing on something that feels kind of nebulous, like how do you know when happy has arrived? You know, because happy could be buying a new house. Happy could be getting a new pair, you know, of gloves. Happy could be running into an old friend. Happy could be if somebody calling you on the phone and telling you you just you know, won a lottery. Happy could show up in all sorts of different ways. <laughs> but you don't, it's like how, if you want to be happy, do you focus on winning the lottery? Maybe. Do you focus on a lost loved one coming back into your life? Maybe. But I wouldn't go there. I would just focus on the feeling of happy and let those things just kind of show up. And that's just it, because as long as you're in that positive frame of mind, that's when the good things happen, which simultaneously and coincidentally is what, Today's chapter is all about. <laughs> it's all about okay. getting into that state. In fact, uh, uh, when we look at section two of the book, this is once again the book, The Law of Attraction, The Basics of the Teachings of Abraham, which we're spending some time on for a number of uh, afternoon episodes going forward. This subsection is entitled The Universal Law of Attraction Defined. So, you know, that's probably a good thing to start with, right? We have to define our terms before we can <laughs> go anywhere with them. So exactly. let, me just, let me just read the first three paragraphs here to get it started. 
Uh, Jerry starts off, most of the, the stuff in the book, by the way, is conversations between Jerry and Abraham because of, you know, the, their respective roles. Esther's the channeler, the one, not, we, no, what's the word? We don't use channeler. What's the word we use to describe? She's the, the receiver. receiver. She's the receiver. receiver. So uh, Esther's the receiver. Abraham is the collected uh, collection of, of non-physical entities who are sending the information, and Jerry is the one who's interacting with them through as Esther. So Jerry says, well, Abraham, I assume that the first subject that we will discuss, that you, that you will discuss with us in detail, is the law of attraction. I know you've said that this is the most powerful law. And Abraham replies, not only is the law of attraction the most powerful law in the universe, but you must understand it before anything else that we will offer will be of value. And you must understand it before anything you are living or anything you observe anyone else living will make any sense. Everything in your life and the lives of those around you is affected by the law of attraction. It is the basis of everything that you see manifesting. It is the basis of everything that comes into your experience. An awareness of the law of attraction and an understanding of how it works is essential to living life on purpose. In fact, it is essential to living the life of joy that you came forth to live. The law of attraction says that which is like unto itself is drawn. When you say birds of a feather flock together, you are actually talking about the law of attraction. You see it evidenced when you wake up feeling unhappy and then throughout the day, Things get worse and worse. And at the end of the day, you say, I shouldn't have gotten out of bed. And you see the law of attraction evidenced in your society when you see that the one who speaks most about illness has illness. When you see that the one who speaks most about prosperity has prosperity. The law of attraction is evident when you set your radio dial on 6.30 a.m. and you expect to receive the broadcast from the transmitting tower of 6.30 a.m., because you understand that the radio signals between the transmitting tower and your receiver must match. So as you begin to understand, or better stated, as you begin to remember this powerful law of attraction, the evidence of it that surrounds you will be easily apparent, for you will begin to recognize the exact correlation between what you have been thinking about and what is actually coming into your experience. Nothing merely shows up in your experience. You attract it all of it, no exceptions. That last bit right there. That's the part where yeah. when I heard that for the first time, and that was, this book is not the first time I heard that, but when I heard that for the first time, that caught my attention. Because I'm that's, a pretty, that's a pretty that's a pretty strong statement. You attract it all. All of it. No exceptions. No exceptions. Yeah. No and, exceptions. You attract it all. All so, of it. So no everything in my yeah. life I attracted. That that's well it's a little bit uh um uh, I'm not sure what the right word is, <laughs> daunting. Um, it, it kind of puts me in my place like, oh, I attracted all of it. <laughs> oh, dear, I can't blame anybody for any of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, you know, blame is kind of like synonymous with just how often people, I mean, how, how people talk, how people true. think. Yeah, it's true. And yeah. I was one of those, I have to admit, I was one of those who thought that way. It took me a while before I finally understood that blame really doesn't fit into it at all. That the law of attraction really has nothing at all to do with blame. But at first, I mean, that's the first thing we're all thinking of because that's what we've been trained to think. That if there's something that you did, it's your fault. Which kind of shows just how sick our society can be. <laughs> you know, I, I work with somebody who every time something doesn't happen the way it was planned or scheduled... And I inquire, like, what's up? Where were you? How did this happen? It is a litany of excuses that mm. comes out of this person's mouth mm -hmm. every single time. Yep. And I keep waiting for the moment when this person says, you know what? I screwed up. Or, you know, I have no excuses. Yeah, I just didn't pay attention. i got to tell you, I would feel so relieved to hear that. <laughs> Because it would make me feel like I'm talking to somebody and now we can do something about it. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. we can have a strategy, perhaps, that we put in place in order to make certain that this doesn't happen again, or at least create a likeliness that it doesn't happen again. But when there's a myriad of excuses that are being used, and they're all different, oh yeah, it's kind of like you don't know what to do with it. And I'm, I'm kind of a little bit in that place of, I don't know what to do anymore, you know, um, and so I'm now asking myself the question, well, I'm a co-creator in this. 
So if I'm working with this person and this person has a litany of excuses, I wonder what it is in me that's vibrating to having this person show up in my world and have a bunch of excuses. Because that's how responsible I am. It all, 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 no exceptions, has something to do with what I'm vibrating to. Well, I don't know if this will help you or not, but I love something that Joel Elston says about the question of excuses. Uh, he actually did a whole series of Facebook posts on the topic uh, sometime late last year. And they were really great. And they were funny. And they, they were all basically on the same point over and over again. Uh, my favorite one of all, the ones that he quoted, uh, was one that said, this ruling just in from the U.S. Supreme Court, your excuses still aren't valid. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, though, and it really says it. Your excuses still aren't valid. <laughs> and we're all good at making excuses, but the fact is none of them are valid. What, what does it mean to have a valid excuse? Uh, does, to have a valid excuse means I don't have to accept responsibility for having brought something into my life. You know, that's interesting because I just now like felt into when I just went through another one of these things today with my colleague, and... I couldn't get a hold of this person through um, instant message or through email, so I tried texting, and I still wasn't getting anything. And then finally, like an hour later, I got a text response, and I read the excuses. And what I felt was, and I didn't realize it till just now, the excuses were so long-winded <laughs> that it kind of put me in a position of, you know what, I don't even want to respond. And so I'm wondering if the excuses are like this person's wall to say to the world, please don't come at me and tell me that I've done something wrong. I already know it, and I just can't handle hearing you tell it to me too. And so if this person does a long-winded set of excuses, and that's what happens routinely, it puts me in a position of, you know what, I've already wasted enough time on having this thing delayed or you blowing off an appointment, I don't want to waste any more time, so I'm just not even going to talk about it. Now, I can give you an alternative way. This is not for everybody. This You have to have kind of a twisted sense of humor like I have in order to do this one, okay? <laughs> okay, twisted sense of a humor alert. <laughs> yes, twisted sense of humor alert. So you get somebody like that, and they, they're, they're sending you these emails, and they're they're giving you all these long lists of excuses. And all you do is write back and you say, I understand the dog ate your homework. <laughs> that does kind of like speak oh. your message loud and clear. It really does. It? Like, I'm not buying it. <laughs> I'm not buying it. We're laughing at it together, but I'm not buying it. <laughs> <laughs> or all of those things, a.k.a. equals, your dog ate your homework. Yeah, That's I right. get it. <laughs> that is funny. I do like that. <laughs> But it does have me curious what in me is vibrating to that similar wavelength that it would bring this into my world. Like, what am I not looking at? Um, well, one thing Where that, am I not maybe holding up my end of the bargain? One, one thing that might give you a clue is apparently you put a lot of energy into very understandably listening to and acknowledging their excuses. And I'm wondering, was that really a good use of energy? Okay, when you say acknowledging their excuses, I'm not. Oh, you haven't? I, I thought you had a history of having acknowledged them. Maybe I'm wrong. No, she has, this person has a history of telling them. Oh, And so... I have a activity, um, thing in my life. It's like when I hear a whole litany of excuses, I might say something like, got it. You know, I mean, I don't engage in it because I don't believe it. Oh, okay. So what's what keeps them going then? I mean... If they're not getting any direct response, they're not getting any energy back. So what what are they getting out of it? Do you have any idea? Well, I think what I just said is part of it. They're creating a wall. In other words, what they get out of having all these excuses, and they do it in a really lengthy way in terms of how it's communicated, um, creates a wall of words to keep me from even commenting or going down that road. So it sounds like 
you're saying then they really don't want to hear from you. I think this person already knows that what they've done is wrong or they've made a mistake or there's been a blunder or there's been a lack of responsibility. Um, and I think they know it so well, they just don't want anyone on the outside world to actually mirror it back or to reiterate it. Oh, that's true. I, I guess I'm just understanding why you're the one they have to say this to. Because I'm the one that they're blowing off. In ah. other words, I'm, I'm due some kind of explanation when they blow off my appointment. Ah, okay. They're, they may be doing it with other people, too, and I'm, they probably are, because I doubt I'm isolated in this. But um, I, I assume this is somebody in the work environment, somebody that you're supposed to interact mm -hmm. with? Mm -hmm, on a regular basis. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What would happen, and I know this is a little bit daring, but what would happen if you were to blow them off on something that they wanted? Me being the ultra-responsible individual I am, I'd have a very hard time doing that. Ah. Like, if I know that I'm going to be late, before the hour hits that we're supposed to be meeting, I've already sent communications letting them know I'm going to be two minutes late, and I'll ping them the moment I'm ready. Because that's my level of communication with everybody across the board. But, you know, I was having a discussion with another coworker last week, kind of on the same subject, which is it's so shocking to me that when you have something on your calendar and you know you have a certain appointment, that like when you go on vacation – and you have a set appointment with somebody that you don't say, hey, by the way, I'm going to be on vacation. Can we either reschedule or cancel? Mm -hmm. And instead, what I get is I get a phone call or a text from my boss saying, hey, I'm supposed to be on a call with Bill Smith right now, and Bill's not calling in. What, it, what might you know? And I'll go flip to Bill's calendar, and I'll go, oh, son of a gun, he's on vacation this week. And that to me is just like astounding that somebody, that the person, Bill Smith, who went on vacation, didn't, quote, scrub his calendar mm -hmm. or be responsible for what's on his calendar. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the whole world is supposed to just know, oh, you're on vacation, so you're not going to make this call. Because to me, that holds up somebody's calendar time that they could have talked with someone else. Mm -hmm. But to me, that's an irresponsibility kind of thing. So, Which it is. Yeah, so since, okay, here, here's how Wendy d does her own process. So, like, I raise the question, what in me is vibrating at a level that would cause my, the other coworker, the one that I work with on a regular basis, to blow me off and have a ton of excuses for it? And now the next story I told was about somebody else, even though it didn't have to do with me, but it still had, this, still had to do with the same topic of not being responsible so, well, it sounds to me on, one, on some level you're tolerating it because I don't really hear like the person who's doing this has any consequences that they're suffering. So, I mean, you're, you're the one who's tolerating it, right? I don't know that I'd say that. Um, I'm working through it. But, but I'd say the bigger picture is I've just told two stories and what they have in common is lack of responsibility. Mm-hmm. Still looking for like because sometimes we'll talk about you know if you clear your vibrational energy or bring your vibrational energy to a place of neutral where something is no longer a problem, then your broadcast signal changes, right? Right. Well, I don't have the answer at this moment, but I'm kind of in the moment processing this for myself. I've just landed on as oh, this is a lack of responsibility issue. Now, it could be mine that I'm being irresponsible somewhere that I'm not aware of, or it could be that I have a problem when people do it, or it could be something from childhood where somebody was irresponsible and it irritated me, and so it's still active in my vibration. But that's kind of where I will go digging, if you will, for well, that, well, what let me this ask is you about. Something. And what I know for certain is once I um, find a new way to look on the situation – or I find what was underneath it all to begin with and then find a new way to look at it, Parker either will leave my experience with me, or if they do, it won't be a problem for me at all. Okay, I can understand that. Sure. The part that I'm still missing, though, 
and maybe you can fill this in for me somehow. Okay. Person X has responsibilities to you that you need to have mm-hmm. done by person X. Person X blows you off somewhat regularly, it sounds like. And each time that person mm-hmm. X blows you off, they give you a litany of excuses to defend it. And what I don't hear anywhere in there is either right. how it, you end up having to fix it one way or another or, or how it gets resolved, I guess. That's what I'm looking for. How does it ultimately get resolved? Who, who ends up <laughs> fixing this situation? And what are the consequences for the person who blew you off? I don't hear any of that. Well, I mean, if, the, if person X blows me off, like person X blew me off this morning when I said, can we do something at 11 Eastern time? And the answer was, yes, of course. And then 11 Eastern time came, and I I am them and said, okay, I'm ready to roll. And there was no response. As a matter of fact, the system said that they were not signed into the IM system. Mm-hmm. So I went, okay. okay. So I sent an email, got no response. So I sent a text, got no response. So I wasn't upset or angry. I just went, okay, I'm going to move on to something else right now. And I did. Mm-hmm. And then about an hour later, I got a text response, oh, I didn't see this, and then a litany of excuses. Mm-hmm. To which my response was simply, okay, we've now missed the window of opportunity for us to do X, Y, Z. And so my next window of opportunity is at 1.30 today Eastern Time. And so at 1.30 Eastern Time, we connected and we did what had to be done. But I no longer carry the anger for that kind of thing because Mm -hmm. I'm not going to let somebody else's excuses ruin my day. Right. I just make different choices. So that's how I handle it in the moment. Right. But I recognize there's a pattern going on that I'd like to not have it continue. (laughs) Yeah. And that's a good way to handle it in the moment. It just strikes me that until Bill Smith or whatever the person's name is has some consequence that affects him, I don't see how he's going to change his pattern. I mean, it would be nice. It's not my job. It's not, but it's not my job to change him. It's, it's not your job to change him. But mm-hmm. if if he's if, if what you're concerned about, well, you're kind of giving me a double message here. On the one hand, you're telling me it doesn't really bother you. On the other hand, it bothers you enough that you're wondering about it. No, I didn't say it didn't bother me. I said I don't let it, like, bring me down. I don't let it steal my happiness or my joy. Okay, so it's impacting you. That's the point. Right. Well, but it is there and it, it's consistently there and I would like it not to be there so that's something I will work on but the nice thing is I'm at a place in my life that I don't have to get really really pissed off angry and, and oh, absolutely. enraged yeah you don't need that at all no I, I'm like over that I, I kind of looked at it like I said I tried three modes of communication within a three minute period of time when I got an re- immediate response I'm like okay I'm on to the next project mm-hmm. and then mentally I was just rearranging Okay, we, it is something this person and I do need to accomplish together. So my next opportunity is at one thirty. We'll try it again later. Mm-hmm. And well, I guess as yeah. long as that suits you and that suits your working schedule and so forth, then I suppose there is really not a, a, a problem here at all. There's nothing that needs to be fixed in any way. Well, but I didn't say that. There is still a pattern that I'm I'm not thrilled over. That still occurs in a way that is somewhat disruptive. Mm -hmm. I just don't choose to have an emotional response of anger towards it. Right. Yeah. And that that makes sense. But I am aware of it, and I I would call it a problem. I guess then if it were me, I'd still find some way to make sure that Bill Smith experienced some degree of consequence. That Ah. and, And probably the best way to make that happen is look at something that I'm doing that... I am doing to kind of bend to facilitate him, to enable him, and just stop doing whatever that thing is. I, I can't really tell well, exactly what it is from what you're saying, but something like that. So I'll, I, here's how I look at it differently. And I think it's worth talking about because I think it's worth listeners kind of catching different ways of applying mm-hmm. the principles of law of attraction. Oh, yeah. So because I know it's not my business to change anybody. Right. The only thing I have control over is my response to things. Mm -hmm. How I look at the situation is it's not my responsibility to make sure this person has consequences or even ever fixes it. It's none of my business is how I look at it. Mm -hmm. However, 
the fact that it has been showing up in my life, even if it's just as an annoyance, it tells me I have something active in my vibration that is matching to this annoyance. So I need to look only at Wendy, what's going on in my thought process, what's going on internally for me that is active, because once I change that, Walt, and once it, it turns into something different that's of a more positive nature, what has to happen, because law of attraction is a law, it's not a wish. By law, this situation between person X and me will cease to happen, or I will cease to find it an annoyance. I agree. I, I yeah. agree that's exactly so, what you're looking for. I would just go one step further and say, yes, it's not up to you to provide a consequence. But I do think what is up to you is to find that thing that you're doing that essentially you're doing to yourself. And in whatever step you have to take in order to change whatever that is, and, and so far we're not really clearly defining what that might be, whatever that step is becomes a consequence. It doesn't. It isn't that you're deliberately trying to deliver a consequence to him, but the simple fact is when you make an adjustment and you ultimately end up changing your behavior in some way, that does have consequential effects on him. So, yeah, I don't, I, I don't even think in terms of consequences. I, I know you don't. I know you don't. But I, that's the way I know it's going to have to iron out because until whatever that thing is that you have to change in your thought process changes, that's basically going to continue to enable him. And, and it, the two have to go hand in hand. They can't really be separated, I don't think. I mean, yes, you have, to, you, have to separate, you have to separate in your thought blood. process. I get that. But in terms of the actual way it plays out, they, they, the two work together. See, I'm hearing a flawed premise in what you're saying. Okay, and this go ahead. Is, and, and I'll give you an example as to how. So I know I've shared before that I used to work for somebody who was my boss, and he represented all the unresolved issues I had with my father. <laughs> okay. And once I recognized that, I started kind of picking them off one at a time. So if he and I would have a conversation and it ended up where I was either hurt or felt angry, I would take that feeling – and I'd work on it, and I'd try to get to the bottom of what am I really thinking? What is it about that hurt feeling that devastated me so much? And I would eventually find it, and I, let's say, and I'll just use an example, let's say it was something where my dad did or said something to me that hurt my feelings. Well, I would ask my inner being to help me with, how do you see the situation and that I'm somehow missing? And I remember one situation where what the guidance I received was, your father was showing you love, even though he was using angry words to do it, because that's how it was shown to him. Mm -hmm. But it didn't mean he didn't love you. And so my takeaway from that was, oh, my dad really did love me. And I think because he had such angry words and such an angry tone of voice, I completely missed that he loved me. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was indicating he didn't love me. Mm -hmm. And so when I replaced... These angry words indicate that he just is trying to be cruel to me, and I replaced it with, oh, this is my dad showing love. Okay, I am loved, all is well. Well, then, the next time my boss did the same kind of thing, instead of being so hurt like a wounded child, it was a very neutral situation because I thought, oh, he's probably just acting out, taught how to act in situations such as this, to be personal toward me, these are just his behaviors. This is about him. It's not about Wendy. It's about him. Mm -hmm. And so I yeah. no longer took it personally, and then I get off the phone and I giggle to myself. This feels so fabulous because it's no longer personal. It's not him trying to hurt me. This is all about himself. And he was using me kind of as his object of whatever, Mm -hmm. to act out his stuff. Right. But when that happened over and over, and he kept doing the same things over and over, he didn't change. He never had a consequence. I just no longer felt bad. I no, no longer took the stuff personally. And then when it happened over and over, I went, okay, now, we're, now it's so obvious to me we're not even a match anymore. We would no longer be working together much longer. 
find a new job or find a new place in the work within that company, and that's what happened. So there was a consequence. Saying about this create any consequences for my boss, whether he continues that behavior now wherever he is, that's not up to me. I, it's none of my business. But I took care of me. Or do I take things like that personally? I'm able to go, oh, it's not about me at all. It's about him. That's, that's his style of communication. I agree with and everything no you said. There, there's, only one thing I would, affecting me. there's only one thing I would add. There was a consequence. The okay, consequence, the consequence is that he ended up moving someplace else. He no longer had the benefit of working with you. Well, that's a kind thing to say, but I, actually, I think him moving on was what was in his vortex. He wasn't happy in his job. I knew he needed a new place to go. He needed a new place to go. But you know, so who wants to say I think I'll quit when I'm making a lot of money? So, so that can't be a consequence. So we have this false um, image that a consequence has to be something negative. Well, that, and I was just going to say, if we define terms, I think of a consequence as negative. That, to me, was just the, the netted result. Yeah. Uh, well, to me, that is a consequence. A consequence, consequence is what consequence means. It's the next step in the sequence. And, and this whole okay. idea of consequence being a negative is, is a very sad and unfortunate result of misuse of the word but truly a consequence does not have to be negative consequences can be positive the whole idea okay, of a consequence so is that it's something that inevitably must follow is the, i'm sorry uh oh do we lose you consequence to you is what i would call an end result to me then yes, we are on the same page. Okay. And so where I called it a false premise, that was because I was, I thought you were saying that somehow person X has to experience some negative result that I have to deliver it. No. Saying, no, no, I, no, no. I have nothing to do with it. I get to, all I do is take care of Wendy, take care of because the universe rearranges everything based on what man is what. Right. Uh, by the way, to that kind of behavior, it'll change. By the way, we're experiencing some of these uh, sound issues that you and I were talking about before the show. Why don't I take a moment to remind people about uh, subscribe and share? You can reconnect while I'm doing that, and hopefully that'll clear it up. Okay. All right. So while Wendy is reconnecting, all right, I'm hanging up. Okay. So while Wendy's reconnecting, just want to remind everybody that. We want you to subscribe and share. Now, subscribe and share is pretty much what it sounds like. If you have already subscribed to the podcast, you're golden. All you really have to do is share at this point. But if this is a new podcast for you and you're enjoying it and you're getting good stuff out of it, we want you to subscribe and get it too because the people who subscribe are the ones who are finding that the subscription pays off huge dividends for them. The average person listening, we know this from the statistics on uh, the program itself, we know that when people are listening, they're listening lots of times. On average, 30 podcasts per month is what the average listener is listening to. So it really pays to subscribe. So simply all you do is you go to LOAToday.net. You click on any of the click to subscribe buttons. If you're using an iPhone, it really is easy at that point because it just walks you through the process. If you're using an Android type phone, such as a Motorola or a Samsung or uh, uh, let's say a Nokia or an LG or one of these others, then you do need to get a podcast software or podcast app installed on your phone. And that is best done through, well, there, there are a number of them that are available. You can get them all through the Play Store. That's really the main issue. You can get them through the Play Store. There's a nice free one called Podcast Manager. Download that. And once you download and install it, um, you'll be able to then do a search through the app for LOA Today. So any way that you choose to do it, please do subscribe and share. And uh, in the process, you will find that uh, you're getting you know, the ongoing experience of being an, a, a subscriber to LOA Today. And it'll give you all the more reason to share. So subscribe and share. And I think we got you back. Wendy, are you there now? Here. Ah, there you are. A little bit, a uh, little bit distorted. Hopefully, that's going to clear up in about ten seconds or so. Um, and you're obviously because you're on a different device, it's going to sound different. But uh, let let's see if this works now. Hopefully, it's going to clear up all the issues we had. <laughs> okay. 
Ah, there you are. Yeah, that sounds a lot better. So I think we figured out consequences is something that it just depends on how we define the word. Um, and, and apparently you were using a different definition from me. But now that we have the definition ironed out, I think we're on the same page on this thing. Well, cool. well I've been told by uh, some of my friends who listen that when you and I don't agree, they really like it. So yeah. I thought I'd go there. <laughs> Well, we're so glad we could provide that entertainment level for people. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's what I've been told. Well, it's kind of entertaining when you and Walter are not on the same page. I'm like, okay, hey, whatever. <laughs> oh, that's funny, though. But it is a good what, – what we were talking about, though, is, is a good exploration of some of the nuances that become involved when we're first trying and even later on when we're trying to apply the law of attraction because this stuff can get – really hairy it seems so simple on the surface it is simple on the surface and yet when it comes mm -hmm. down to actually applying this stuff it's just incredible all the different ways we just trip over ourselves trying to figure out well what's the best route and and you're actually really good at this and i've gotten fairly good at it too and even we had trouble dealing with this one particular issue it, it's just something that takes i think it takes a lifetime of practice to really learn how to apply it well it's actually fun. I, I mean, when people talk about, you know, joy is in the journey, I truly love the journey. Even if I bump up against things that don't feel good to me, I get pleasure in going, oh, yippee, I have something to work on. <laughs> I get to investigate it and figure it out. And, and that to me is fun, um, partially because I love the activity, but another part is, I get to experience my inner being providing information and guidance and uh, nuance. And like, you know, earlier in this conversation, I put two things together. I said, okay, I just talked about two things in a row. They both have to do with lack of responsibility. And I got this sense of now you're onto something. Like, so what I'll take away from this when I get off the call and I'll work on it for myself is I'll start with the concept of, responsibility, lack of responsibility, how do I feel about responsibility, what has my history been with responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. And I will land on what the little nugget is that has been like kind of the, the pebble in the shoe for me. Because mm -hmm. I think it's a small thing for me. If it was big, I'd be really outraged when person X. But the fact that I don't and I have such little reaction tells me it's really just a pebble in my shoe on my shoe anymore and, and clearly it has been because like you said you could easily have gotten really upset and angry about the whole thing and, and that hasn't been your reaction at all so i mean getting a pebble out of the shoe that's minor compared to what kind of a blow up it could have been and it wasn't that's good that's a win well and i will i will tell you once upon a time this would not have been a pebble in a shoe episode it would have been something huge and made me angry and but things have changed in my life because I've worked on a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. I cleared up a lot of my active vibrations that were not serving me. But this is why this is exciting to me because it shows me there's another little something that I didn't quite catch, another uh, maybe aspect of something. And it's like, oh, cool, now I get to go after this one too. I love it because then eventually there'll be no pebble in my shoe either. That's true. And actually, what we've been talking mm -hmm. about actually fits into the second section of, of this uh, this larger section, the, the second subsection. Giving thought to it is inviting it. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about the various mm -hmm. ways that you gave thought to the situation. And and you were trying to figure out, and actually, I think you have found a way to get around the inviting of it. So I suspect once you have it all ironed out in your own mind the way you want to do it, you're going to stop inviting it. And when that happens, the mm -hmm. pebble will be no longer in the shoe. Mm hmm Which is going to be very yay. cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yay indeed. So now here's, here's something you can't hear just because, you know, noise canceling head, headphones are so awesome. But, you know, I'm in my home, and I have like 7,000 million smoke detectors. Okay, slight <laughs> exaggeration. It just seems like that many. And when I started talking about it's a responsibility issue. As soon as I finished that sentence, I heard one of my smoke detectors give a ring. Uh -huh. And it's now doing it every, every 60 seconds. Now, not, this doesn't have to mean this, but I pay attention to when things like that show up. <laughs> like, what was I thinking or saying right when that happened? 
because I believe in synchronicity in every area of my life. And so what that says to me was, yes, once again, I got the initial feeling when I talked about responsibility, like, yeah, I'm onto something. Round to it, and by the alarm going off, that's kind of like, to me, my inner being's way of punctuating it and say, yeah, stay on that track. It has to be the responsibility issue, which, by the way, used to be one of the biggest, hugest issues in my life, and now it's down to just a pebble in my shoe. Mm -hmm. So. Anyway, I just thought I'd let you know, right here, live, on the show, I'm getting signals from my inner being letting me know what I need to work on. <laughs> and, and I'm sure that uh, what you're describing there is probably tied to a, a battery that needs replacing in a smoke detector. But the fact that it chose to just, at that very moment in time, start to just fall below the level where it says, I need a new battery, that's where the synchronicity happened. Exactly. Yes. Like, why now? Why now? Right. Because of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and it, I find it interesting that you you're able to find synchronicities in everything. There was the longest time where I didn't think there were synchronicities in anything. I thought they were just pure, plain, unrelated coincidences. You've actually convinced me that mm -hmm. none of them are coincidences. That that all of them are connected. But you're, you've gotten so good <laughs> at finding you know what the connection is. A lot of the time, you know, I'll see something. I'll say, well, according to Wendy, that's a that's got connection to something. I have. Not the faintest idea what it's connected to, but <laughs> well, and well, you know what that happens to me too. About well, I know this has a meaning. I don't know what the meaning is. If the meaning wants to make itself known to me, I have ears to hear. I think. <laughs> okay. if not, and if not, my inner being will get my attention in another way. So I never freak out if I can't figure out something right now, because. There are so many signals and signs and symbols and things that can show up in, in our lives to give us messages that it's like, if I miss one message, I'll get the next one. And if I miss that one, I'll get the next one. Kind of like a bus, huh? <laughs> you miss one, there's another one in five minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and kind of tying you it know, off. I'm never, I, oh, go ahead. I'm never concerned that my inner being will not get my attention. My inner being is me. It's just another aspect of me. It's the part of me that is isn't complete non-physical. And so me loves me. <laughs> Which is very good. I'm glad of that. I'm glad that our inner me's yeah, love us. Yeah. <laughs> the me and me cares about what happens to me. Mm -hmm. And so the me and me will always work its best to get my attention. <laughs> yeah. Well, apparently it gets your attention a lot. So I, I give you credit for being able to hear mm -hmm. it. But anyway, to finish off this, this section, I just want to read the last two paragraphs of this subsection. It says, your, your physical world is a vast and diverse place full of amazing variety of events and circumstances, some of which you approve of and would like to experience, and some of which you disapprove of and would not like to experience. It was not your intention as you came forth into this physical experience to ask the world to change in order to accommodate your opinions of the way things should be. Kind of a throwback to what we were talking about by eliminating all things that you do not approve of and adding to the things you do mm -hmm. approve of. You are here to create the world around you that you choose while you allow the world as others choose it to be to exist also. And while their choices in no way hinder your own choices, your attention to what they are choosing does affect your vibration and therefore your own point of attraction. And that last bit there, not only does it tie together nicely what we were talking about, but I've always found that that concept to be really an, an interesting slash convoluted concept because of that one sentence. You are here to create the world around you that you choose while you allow the world as others choose it to be to exist also. In other words, both coexist at the same time. Your world is actually different in certain ways from their world. And that, that philosophically, that's quite a concept. Yeah. Just that. I mean, to me, that that's to... just a big thing. Just the fact that, that different well, people have... We... Oops. Oh, we're having the sound problems again. Did I lose you? I'm still here. Oh, okay. Um, just the fact that you can have two people in the same world experiencing two different kinds of worlds at the same time that to me is philosophically fascinating 
because my experience growing up was, <laughs> well, we all experienced the same world, right? Well, no, apparently not. Goodness. We so that we have on ourselves called beliefs is what makes each one a completely different experience. You're going to have to repeat that, um, one, I'm afraid, because your voice kind of went through that funny, some... that you went, went through that funky uh, sound thing. So you'll have to repeat that last bit. Okay. So our beliefs are the filters on how we experience things, but also uniquely different because we all have such very different beliefs. So the beliefs, in other words, are generating yeah. and, and driving the experience of the world. Um, like, as a matter of fact, I had gotten an email from somebody the other day, and um, they come from a very um, uh, religious background, mm -hmm. talking to me in the email about how they had connected with somebody else who has a very religious background. Now, on the surface, they both practice the same religion. What I was hearing from person A was that person B option in, in his life. And so I was curious and I said, well, what are you calling spiritual deception? First of all, that's a thing of defining terms. Thing that person A, when talking to person B, found out person B, B is spiritually deceived. Oprah, how can you touch Oprah? <laughs> well, Unfortunately, the sound problems are giving us problems there, so I, I'm not sure I caught the whole story there. And the only thing I can say that's good is we only have about three minutes left in the program, so we'll that's gonna give us time to fix it for the next time around. Uh, because it, you obviously had a good story there, but we okay. just did, we just didn't get it. You can try one more time. We got three minutes left. Well, you know me; I got plenty of stories. I can tell them anytime on any show, so <laughs> it's true. really okay. Take, take this one home. Why don't you put this show to bed, and I will try to be more quiet so that people don't hear me on a, a <laughs> no, we intermittent love signal. <laughs> we just got to. I, I think this is. We take uh, uh, for people who are curious. We take uh, the call from Wendy through Google Hangouts. There's a Google Voice number that it comes through, and and that seems to be where the problem is. So actually, tomorrow, Wendy, maybe we'll try to do it through Skype because even w with you taking it off of your Wi-Fi, there's there's still this funky thing going on. But we'll we'll get that ironed out. Um, just wanted to remind everybody okay, though. Well, me, do you want me to? Do what was that? Well, now we're getting nothing. <laughs> okay. Call back on Skype. Well, we got about two minutes left. I, there's probably not a point in doing the the call back on Skype. Let's let's just try to finish up with what we got. But uh, just want to remind okay, everybody: ahead. if you haven't subscribed and shared, you want to do the subscribe and share. And we also want to remind you that a week from today, Tuesday evening, 9 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to be adding a show to the program. That's going to be a great opportunity for you to call in if you're somebody who can't call in during the day. You're working during the day or you, you're just not able to get to a phone and you'd like to call in and ask questions. Well, Tom Wells and I are going to be doing the show each Tuesday evening from 9 to 10 p.m. So save your questions up and get ready to call on Tuesday. And if we get enough calls, we may even go longer than, than one hour. In fact, Wendy, it's going to be interesting to see just how long we have to go. Who knows how many questions we're going to have that night. <laughs> And also, I love it. just as a reminder for people who are looking for some personal assistance, if they want to get that personal assistance, they want to call you, and hopefully they aren't calling you on a Google Voice number where they can actually talk to you. How, <laughs> how do they reach no. you? <laughs> I, don't have a, I don't have a Google Voice number. I have a regular old landline number. Oh, that's good. Um, that's good. <laughs> people can reach me at wendydillard.com, and both my email and my uh, home number are there and available for you to call me. And guaranteed not to be Google Voice. So <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> Wendy, it's been a pleasure, and hopefully we'll have everything technically ironed out. Uh, tomorrow's going to be a, a fresh day and a fresh start, so we'll we'll do it again then. What do you say? Sounds like a good plan. All right. We hope you come back as well tomorrow here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye now.